So, welcome everybody to Abbey uh, Defence. So, um, I am going to tell you a little bit of the introduction and to help me so I don't open it up and have written down. So, um, so, Abby's background is she got uh, bachelor's degrees in both biology and anthropology from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and then she spent um, five years or so working in various lab jobs in Pittsburgh. So, she was a technician and a lab manager. And that absolutely showed what she's here. That um, she, someone who, when she was the de facto manager of my lab for a long time. Um, and she actually came to UW then in 2008. And, um, oh, I should have waited another minute. I didn't notice you weren't in. <laughs> um, um, so, so, um, and so, you know, just the background when she, um, I think, it, I, maybe I'm wrong with this, but my recollection is that when uh, Abby came to interview, this idea of maybe doing something on cell shape evolution and looking at trichomes, that's when it's emerged. Yes. So, um, so she came in with sort of a relatively clear idea of a possible project, but it was a project that had no foundation. She had to build everything from scratch. So, um, and which she did, which is amazing. But, in a I'll come back to research in a minute, but just to highlight what else she did. She did a lot of teaching. She taught almost every semester here. Um, she, um, and she got uh, an award for teaching, the LNS Teaching Award. Um, it was involved in training with teachers. Uh, she also, and I love this, you know, she really got very involved in lots of other activities. So she, was, uh, she ran the Evolution Seminar Series. She, for several years, coordinated the um, outreach to the uh, events and the volunteers for the Dharma for Darwin Day. Um, she was on a budget committee. She was a scratch rep for many years. Um, she was on the plant biochemist search committee. So, for those of you who say thank you. <laughs> uh, um, and um, so she was very involved. Um, she also got involved in a lot of outreach. I had them on the last, I got one of my slides mixed up there, but that's okay. Uh, so, you know, working in local schools, the outreach symposium, uh, her and I guess with Alison did this expanding your right workshop in middle school students, which is a good thing. Uh, she also, um, they also put on, I think, well, worked in Grandparents University, um, and actually got nice, and, and uh, science exhibition, so this is her at Grandparents University. And if, anybody, if anyone who doesn't know about it, you should get involved in the call. Um, so, um, so she was, been very engaged member of the university and department of the community the whole time she was here, and she was integral in my lab. So I've got some lab pictures, um, and um, <laughs> over time, um, and you can see she was hiding behind that tree up there. No, so that's the most recent one. And I actually went to the website, and I don't know if you've noticed this. If you should, if you have, you might not be happy. So you're neither a current lab member nor a past lab member. So I really, so you are what I would call you are a Skype. <laughs> so for the last, this is a screenshot, for the last uh, year and a half, we've been meeting every week like this, yeah. And I got very familiar with those certificates, but, um, so, um, now, I mean, Abby is, everyone knows, Abby's a lot of fun to have around, she doesn't like a photo taken, you, uh, and I don't know if you know that this as well, that, that picture, that if you search for the images for Abby Maybe. That top right one is the one you get. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. And I, what is this? I actually don't know what you were supposed to be. Was it a. Was it a, a oh, from Super Mario Brothers. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 uh, I thought it might be uh, Amalite and Scary. So I found this picture of her with her at her high school prom, and that's her. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe this is her son, uh, Simon. Um, I did the band event. Yes, this was, he was just there doing senior band night, so he just walked out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to believe he's your son. But, um, anyway, so um, as I think many of you know, um, you know, I've been that Simon a little uh, years ago. <laughs> But one of the great things about having Abby around is that you know, her, her kids were very much part of lab life. They came to all the lab meetings, they often to be found in lab um, doing things. And, uh, and that's been a, that's a great example, I think, for the other guys to have, have that going on and see you still be productive. 
So in terms of you know what the research, you can Abby will tell you about it in much more detail, but the basic story is the evolution of, of cell shapes, and she decided to focus on trichomes, single cells, impressive cells, in Pfizer area. Um, as I said, she, she brought this from the ground level. I mean, there was nothing in my lab. We didn't, we, we didn't know anything about this. We didn't have to grow the plants or anything. She built it up. Um, it, it means when you're in that situation, everything takes a lot longer, and I think uh, it's an extra big challenge. But I think the one thing that um, I'm sure of is that in the future, you're going to be well able to start a project, a new project, any kind of project, or help your students do that. So, um, so I'm really excited that Abby's uh, got to this point, and uh, I'm going to miss our Skype call. But, <laughs> but I, I, you know, congratulations, and uh, looking forward to the talk. So, Abby, your turn. Thank you for that very lovely introduction. Um, yeah, I'm here today to talk about this research over many years <laughs> that I've done, looking at uh, this candidate gene and its role in the evolution of this novel trichome shape in the muscular family. <clears throat> um, and I'd like to thank Sarah for making this really lovely poster for me. Um, and I, I don't know if everyone knew what this was, but these are uh, actually developing trichomes on a leaf surface. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it's kind of a surreal picture of these trichomes, but I feel like that's, it's felt a little surreal to be able to, to study them and to look at them at this level. So, I know we're in the botany department and probably everyone knows what trichomes are, but I thought <laughs> that I would just remind everyone of how important they can be for plants. Um, they, they can have important roles in protecting plants, um, mostly from insect predators. Um, um, and here, what I'm showing is just a bed bug, um, which are the worst of the insect predators. <laughs> and uh, these little green things are trichomes that are just capturing uh, his leg to make them stop moving on the leaf and not be able to, to eat any more of the plant tissue. Uh, they can also be important, important for nourishment for plants. Um, we're here, we're looking at trichomes, which are trigger hairs for the Venus flytrap to cause it to close and capture insects. Um, some trichomes can also be involved in water absorption, um, in epiphytes, uh, where they don't have root systems, and they'll help them to gather water. Um, and trichomes are also economically important to us, especially glandular trichomes. And this is just an example of oregano. And here's uh, what we're looking at is a peel back cuticle um, where under that would be captured uh, the essential oils. And, um, and a lot of glandular trichomes hold those oils in and we use them for lots of different products. Now my interest in trichomes um, was to use them as a system to look at uh, cell shape diversity and to try to understand what is the developmental, like what are the underlying developmental and genetic changes that happen to make uh, diversity across species. And I thought that the trichomes of the mustard family were a great system to do this. So these are all single cells, um, but they can take on these really incredibly different shapes. Um, and here, and you can see a lot of the shape differences uh, have to do with how they branch and in the length of, of their stock. And so at the top, these are all dendritic trichomes where they have a relatively longer stock um, and several branches that emerge from that stock in different positions. Uh, and there can be lots of different branching patterns. <clears throat> so here are just two branched trichomes and here is Rabidopsis where it has more typically a three branch structure. But there can be trichomes with many more branches than that yeah. with that particular shape. Um, <clears throat> at the bottom, just, just showing these kind of different shapes of trichomes where they, uh, which are relatively less common, and they have a much shorter stock. And in this case, these metafix trichomes, what we're looking at is down on the surface of the leaf. So you're seeing they would have a really tiny stock and then two branches that come out uh, parallel to the leaf surface. And then the most beautiful ones, the stellate trichomes, um, 
also thought to have a relatively shorter stock, but then multiple branches that come out with this radiate pattern to make that star like. So here's uh, just the phylogeny of the whole mustard family. Um, and not all uh, members of the family have trichomes. And so what I'm highlighting here is just species that both have trichomes and where the trichomes are branched. Just to see that overall, um, I'm coloring in orange the dendritic trichomes, and that that is the most common uh, shape for a branching trichome across the family. And relatively less common are the metafix trichomes in purple, um, or the stellate trichomes, which are in blue. And I focused in on this one group. Um, the whole genus is characterized by having stellate trichomes, the Physaria. Uh, and I thought that this group was a good one to look at because um, really, and one reason I was interested is that I think that their trichomes are, are probably the most amazing to look at, and I'll see a lot of pictures of them. Um, but also, uh, we know that those trichomes are derived from a dendritic ancestral state, um, and that's also shared. The very top species actually is Arabidopsis, so you can see that, the, that this genus is fairly closely related to Arabidopsis, and Arabidopsis shares that um, ancestral state of a dendritic. Um, so the stellate trichomes actually in this group are also pretty interesting for their potential role in protecting these plants um, from high light environments. So, so Fizaria lives mostly in the southwestern United States um, and northern Mexico in these really high um, open and intense light environments. And so an important thing for these plants would be to protect them uh, from water loss <coughs> um, or just too much too much light. And so you can see in these pictures, it looks like you know, a crust of trichomes is causing the leaves to look, the leaves to look uh, white and reflect the light away. And probably also they're able to create a barrier um, to help them from, from losing water. And on the right is just, uh, this is actually multiple uh, scanning electron micrograph images that are kind of composed on top of each other. So, so you can see if you zoomed in, you know what that would look like on the cross of the leaf surface. So I'm gonna <clears throat> talk about my own research and what I did to look at this and try to tackle this problem. Um, and so the first thing I wanted to know is what is the developmental basis of this transition from a dendritic shape to the stellate shape. Uh, and how I, I chose to look at that was doing some electron microscopy of developing trichomes, both in Physaria and then in its closest relative, which is Piazonia, that has dendritic trichomes. Um, and I, I kind of used that developmental data to try to come up with a model uh, of how dendritic and stellate trichome uh, development is different between those two, and identify um, identify some characteristics that are only in the stellate lineage. Um, the next, what I wanted to know is, okay, you know, I know what the the developmental differences are, but what's the genetic basis of those differences? Um, so I used a candidate gene approach and looked at the branches trichome gene, and I first looked to see if we could see a different pattern of selection in BLT, um, and then also did interspecies transformation studies uh, to see if actually functionally it was able to change the trichome shape. <clears throat> so start with, you know, what is the developmental basis of this transition? So, you know, in general, it looks like the dendritic trichomes are going to have a different branching pattern, um, but we wanted to kind of get down to that, uh, being able to actually see this development happen and see what are the real changes that that have, have caused these stellate trichomes to evolve from a dendritic ancestor. So just as a basis to start thinking about um, what kind of features to look for, 
Uh, a lot of work has been done in Arabidopsis, looking at the, its dendritic trichome development. Um, and so I thought I would just go through there what we know about how trichomes develop in that species. <clears throat> so trichomes go through kind of three, I, I think of it as being three main stages of, uh, in a series of how they develop from once a trichome cell, uh, once a cell takes on a, a trichome identity. So the first stage is this pre-branching stage um, where you know, a trichome starts to enlarge, but then there is kind of a growth focus where it's able to grow out away from the, the leaf surface um, and you know, create, basically establishing the trichome stock. After that, trichomes start to initiate branches. Um, typically in Arabidopsis, this is, is three, it will end up being three branches that form sequentially. Um, and I'm gonna call this the post-branching stage, just after, after branches have emerged before the trichome has, uh, has matured. And after all branches are initiated, um, the trichome undergoes a diffuse expansion across both branches and the stalk um, to create this, this final form. And through in that, then, <clears throat> um, if you look at the branch tips and the post branching and care, compared to mature, you know, they, the branch tips become more pointed, um, the cell wall actually thickens, and, <laughs> and it forms numerous uh, little bumps or papillae over the, the surface of the cell. So I first wanted to look at uh, what does the stock look like, the trichome stock, as it develops in Pazonia and Pisaria. And to do that, um, I made measurements uh, of both developing, um, and in some cases, mature trichomes. So what I'm showing you here is just in the top right what those developing trichomes would look like. So I tried to look for trichomes where you could see them, you know, from a side view, and then just measured from the tip to the leaf surface and then across the width across the middle. Um, and what you can see <clears throat> with this graph, so this is a graph of, of those pre-branching uh, trichome stalks. And I just mapped out the, the width um, in comparison to the length. And you can see that there's a positive relationship between width and length um, in both Visaria and Pizonia trichomes. <clears throat> and most of the trichomes, um, well, the largest ones are less than 17 microns in width and less than 14 microns in length. And this is a little bit interesting. Um, because they're a similar width to what's seen in Arabidopsis, but actually in both cases, uh, the length is much shorter than about half the size of a similar stage in Arabidopsis trichome development. <clears throat> so I also, I was not able to look at the, the stock in mature Fizaria trichomes, unfortunately. And so in the bottom right, you can see um, an example of, of looking at the Pfizeria trichomes and their branches as they grow, just obscure that stock. And so I wasn't able to, to make measurements on that. But I did measure uh, the stocks of Pazonia trichomes. Um, and that, in comparison to, to what we know is uh, typical in Arabidopsis, um, unsurprisingly, they're, they're a bit shorter uh, about <coughs> half the size of the smallest, actually, Arabidi Arabidopsis stock lengths. Um, and their width, actually, is even, it's at the small end of the range of what you can see in Arabidopsis. <coughs> so I also then made some measurements of, of branches through development. Um, so what we're looking at is in the top right, Pazonia developing branches, and then I um, I noticed as I was looking at these trichomes that actually in Pisaria there are two there could be two different types of branching patterns. 
So first I'll just talk a little bit about the Hazonia ones. <clears throat> um, in that case, as branches develop, a, here is a really young trichome that seems to be making, has two uh, branch growths, and they, what I would see regularly is that you would see two branches in these earliest trichomes that were unequal in size. <clears throat> and then up here is one that looks like it's a little later in development, and it seems like that upper <coughs> larger branch has initiated another branch. And down here, this one is starting to initiate a second additional uh, branch. Um, in Physaria, what I saw was, I'm going to call these type 1, Physaria type 1 trichomes. And in that case, um, all branches came out at the same time um, all around the, the top of the trichome. And those branches would just continue to grow. Um, and not initiate any additional branches. In the Physaria, what I'm going to call type 2, so here you see one of these earliest branching stages, and there were many fewer branches that emerged, but still um, still simultaneously around the, the young trichome. And then those branches did initiate additional, um, have additional branching events. Here's one that's a little farther along. And I would imagine that this had three primary branches, and then you can see two of them now seem to be bifurcating to make, uh, to make secondary branches, where then one is just at a little earlier stage, so it's kind of like the head comes out, and then they bifurcate. <clears throat> and measuring at the, this very, what this graph is is just measurements at the very youngest stage um, of, of trichome branching for each of the different types. So you can see that in blue, we have the Pfizeria type one, and that those ones um, were much smaller, you know, much narrower and, uh, and shorter than either the Pazonia or Pfizeria type two trichomes, which had a more similar size um, when the branches first emerged. So I also made measurements on, here are the mature branches for each of those types. Um, and I made measurements on, on those branches, uh, on the, the external branches of all of them. So in the case of Pfizeria type one, that would be the entire branch because they never made secondary branches. And in Pfizeria type two and Pazonia, you know, it's just from the tip to before bifurcation or before, before they're splitting from another branch. And those are actually pretty similar um, in size. Uh, all, all the branches were at least 100 microns in length. And basically, it looks like uh, the final stages of maturation were, um, were similar for all three types, no matter uh, which species the, the trichome or what type of if it was stellate or dendrite. Um, and in comparison to Rhabdopsis, they go through these same final, every, everything expands, um, the tips become pointed, and they become covered in these tiny lumps, these little pentili. And it's hard to see them right here. Um, the Pazonias have much smaller bumps than Pytheria, or what we see in Rhabdopsis. One thing that I also noted was that um, later branches that emerged were always uh, narrower and, and shorter than the branch that they were derived from. So that's one thing. As branching increases, branches are the next branch would be smaller. <clears throat> so based on all these observations, uh, I tried to come up with a model for how uh, dendritic and stellate development differ. Uh, so what I'm pointing to, the little black arrow, is what I think of as the primary growth focus. So when trichomes first emerge, you know, this tip uh, grows out during that stock creating stage. And I think that in the dendritic trichomes, um, that, that primary growth 
both sides will continue throughout trichome development. It will continue to, uh, to grow and potentially make additional branches. So here in the second, um, second little step, there's a secondary branch that's, um, that's initiated beneath the primary growth focus. And that branch is going to then go on its own path of expansion as the primary focus continues to grow. And really then secondary, all, all additional branching stages are just a reiteration of that first pattern. So here it can create another branch, um, which then itself will grow. That one didn't create any additional branches of its own, but there are two new branches on these side branches. Um, <coughs> And so, so basically, the difference, the main difference then, is that in cellulite development, uh, it starts out the same with its primary growth focus, but then that, that growth uh, ceases to, to develop, and all further growth goes on to the secondary um, branches that come off of it right in the beginning. <clears throat> and then those will expand. So just looking down at the trichomes, um, so while both stellate type 1 and type 2 would have that basic pattern of initiating all branches um, simultaneously and uh, the primary growth ceasing <clears throat> to expand, in type 1, those initial branches um, just grow out and never do anything else, then they just go on to maturity. In type 2, because they made relatively larger initial branches, those, uh, those wider branches are able to branch again. Um, and that, that branching, in a way, is a little similar to what happens um, when the first branches emerge, just in that they're, rather than adding a branch um, you know, be, be the apex, they're actually bifurcating to create its final <coughs> trichrome, the final stellate shape. <coughs> so here's just an overview of the differences uh, between these four trichrome types. So at the top, the two dendritic types, Arabidopsis and Azonia, <coughs> and at the bottom, the two types of Physaria. And so, in, as far as stock length, um, both the dendritic trichomes of Pizonia and of Pizaria seem to share a shorter stock length than what we saw in Arabidopsis. So it doesn't seem like stock length is important for making that stellate shape. Um, the primary growth focus in Arabidopsis and Pizonia, both dendritic trichomes, that's going to persist all the way through to maturity, while in the two types of Pizaria, um, that focus terminates for the growth, um, and growth is retracted. Uh, the branching pattern in Arabidopsis and Pizonia is going to be a sequential pattern of adding additional branches, while in the Pizaria trichomes it's simultaneous, and in the case of the type 2 ones, um, where they make secondary branches, that, that becomes dichotomous. Um, and then we also did note a pretty big difference in the number of branches uh, in the final trichome form. So while in Arabidopsis and Pazonia, it's more like three to six branches. Um, in Visary type one especially, it was common to see trichomes with anywhere from seven to 20 branches, depending on the species. Um, and in type two, typically eight to 10 branches. <clears throat> so I then, you know, based on these differences in branch initiation, um, and position uh, in relation to the stock, I wanted to know what, what might be the genetic basis of these differences we could see in development. <clears throat> I chose a candidate gene approach to look at this. Um, I looked at the branchless trichome gene, or BLT, um, in Arabidopsis. Uh, BLT is necessary for trichome branching. Uh, so if you have loss of function mutants, they're trichomes. This is a trichome with a loss of function BLT in Arabidopsis, and they have no branches 
uh, whatsoever. Um, there also seems to be a dosage dependent effect on the number of branches uh, that can be formed as <clears throat> lines that overexpress BLT tend to have more branches. Um, and the protein is actually known to localize to sites where branches are emerging. <clears throat> and so it seems like BLT <coughs> is likely to be part of the protein complex, at least in Arabidopsis, that can affect the polarity of branch initiation. And so what I first wanted to look at is, <clears throat> does it seem like CLT um, is important for creating, uh, for, for being involved in this transition from dendritic to cellulite trichomes? Uh, could we see that in the genes that there's been a pattern of selection acting on that gene in Phi's area? <clears throat> and so what I was looking for in these analyses are, has uh, selection differed between stellate and dendritic lineages? And do we actually, can we identify an altered pattern of selection that's coincident with the origination of stellate trichomes? And then is selection, um, if it's happening, is it positive selection or is it purifying selection? <clears throat> so to do that, uh, I got BLT sequences um, from across the, the mustard family, um, but mostly focused in the infice area and its close relatives. <clears throat> and I then um, estimated a phylogeny of its evolutionary history across the family. And so the lines just representing the, the three major clades that we find in uh, in the Fizeri E. Uh, so at the bottom is, here is a group of five relatively small genera. I'm gonna call them the DDNLS clade. Um, and that's just an acronym for the genera that are, that are in that clade. Um, and those, those ones, uh, all members have trichomes that have dendritic shape. Um, but are typically a little more highly branched. The other two major clades are the Phaezonia, and here's Phaezonias. Um, <clears throat> those, uh, the trichomes of Phaezonia have dendritic, as we've seen, have dendritic shape, but uh, a little less branched than we've seen in the DDNLS clade. And then Phaezaria were all all trichomes have this stellate shape. Um, the relationship between Phaezaria and Phaezonia is, uh, they, they, they come up to be a sister taxon. It's not well supported uh, with BLT, but it's consistent with, with other genes. Uh, we looked at ITS and also published analyses of classical records. <coughs> And so what I'm going to focus on is, is this clade and looking for, can I identify um, a different pattern of selection in that transition on, along, either along that branch or within the entire clade. <clears throat> and so how I did that was to model codon evolution using, using uh, the non-synonymous to synonymous substitution ratio. Um, and what that looks at is um, it's going to be a numerical value that will tell us what type of selection could be acting um, on, on the gene. So if we see a DNDS ratio of less than one, that's going to indicate that uh, it's under purifying selection. Uh, if we see one greater than one, uh, one of positive selection and neutral evolution would give us a DNDS of close to one. <clears throat> so I 
I used several models to try to identify this change in selective pattern. So this is just a simplified version of what phylogeny I showed you. And what I did first was to, to estimate the DNDS ratio across the entire phylogeny and see you know, if we looked across the whole tree, what would that look like? Um, and what would, yeah, what would the value be? Um, and so this is gonna be model A, and what the zeros are indicating is just the, the groups that stayed together and we, we said would have the same DNDS ratio to be estimated. So in this case, this one ratio model, um, we found that DNDS is less than one, so it seems like as a, as a whole across Rasikasi, uh, it's genes under purifying selection, <coughs> which, uh, which makes sense because I think it's an important gene and you wouldn't want uh, a lot of changes, that those would be helped by selection. But what we're really interested in is, <clears throat> you know, is there a difference in what we, in that, that ratio between Pfizeria and, and the outgroups on the tree? And so we then ran a two ratio model where the entire um, Pfizeria lineage including its stem lineage, could have a different DNDS ratio from all of the other groups on the tree. Um, and we found that, in fact, the DNDS ratio is almost twice that in Pfizeria as outgroups. <clears throat> and and that this, uh, this model fit the data significantly better than a one ratio model. Um, so we wanted to look a little bit more deeply into whether we could, um, whether that increased DNDS was due to, in model C, just a burst of selection along the stem lineage which would coincide with where stellate trichomes originated? Um, or is that change in selective pressure, um, is that retained across the entire crown lineage of the Phys area? And what we found is that <clears throat> the, while the, the Phys area stem lineage did have uh, a relatively higher DNDS ratio than other lineages on the tree. Um, it wasn't supported to, to keep that two ratio model. It wasn't significantly improve uh, our explanation of the data. But the Pfizeria crown lineage having its own ratio, which was separate from both the stem and the rest of the tree, uh, did fit the data significantly better than a one ratio model and was actually the highest the highest likelihood of any model. And here again, um, the actual numbers are that in the crown lineage is about twice as high as in outgroups. So then we wanted to look at um, whether if we had three, a three ratio model that gave separate ratios for the crown, the stem, and then outgroups, would that, would that model fit our data better than a two ratio model where only the crown and outgroups have, are allowed to have different ratios? Um, and while we did see you know, relatively increased DNDS for both the crown and the stem, um, that wasn't a better fit to the data. And so still, model D, um, is our, is our best explanation of how DNDS changes across the tree. <clears throat> and so we finally did one additional model just to look at um, whether the, this increase in DNDS we see is actually um, just a feature of Pfizeria, or if it perhaps there was an increase DNDS ratio in, in the broader Pfizer E. Um, and so it's not related to that stellate form at all. 
And so now we did it, so we did this additional three ratio model that allowed for Visaria to have its own ratio, including its stem, and then um, the other clades in Visaria to have their own ratio, which is also different from other outgroups in Brassicaceae. <clears throat> in this case, uh, this model did not fit the data, uh, so it wasn't a significantly better fit. Um, but it was interesting to note that the, the ratios that were estimated, so the Pfizeria found the stem are still this kind of higher ratio, um, but that actually it was even lower in the other Pfizeria clades than in outgroups. So in conclusion, after running all these different models, the, the best fit is to allow for a different, that, that the, um, there was a higher uh, pure crown selection in, in the Pfizeria crown lineage than in all other lineages of the tree. <clears throat> so it seems like what that would say is that there, we've had an altered pattern of molecular evolution during the radiation of Pfizeria. Um, but that could either be due to maybe positive selection. So you're looking at uh, DNDS across a whole gene. Um, so perhaps some sites in the gene are under positive selection, um, causing this overall increase in DNDS and a higher ratio that we see. Or it could just be that it's relaxed pure line selection um, in twice area. And so we use the, the branch sites test of positive selection to look specifically at if that increased rate we saw was due to positive selection on a subset of codons in the gene. <clears throat> so to do this, we would designate, we just designated what group we wanted to be, the foreground lineage, um, and the DNDS ratio across the gene in the foreground is compared to that of what's designated as the background, so the rest of the gene. <clears throat> And then I would look for um, the proportion of sites in the, in the background and foreground that are under purifying selection and gives you a DNDS, estimates the ratio for those sites. Um, the proportion that is neutrally evolving in both foreground and background. And then these, which is what you're most interested in, those that are either purifying or neutral in the background are actually evolving under positive selection in the foreground. And so, you can see that over 10% of sites seem to be um, undergoing positive selection in the price area. <clears throat> so we also used a Bayesian approach to see within each site um, in the alignment, uh, what is the posterior probability that that site is, uh, is under positive selection. And so this is just at the bottom, um, just each codon position in our alignment. And then the y-axis is its posterior probability of being, um, having evolved under positive selection. And what you can see is that there seems like there is actually a cluster of sites that together have really high posterior probability of having evolved under positive selection. And in addition, in, <clears throat> in Arabidopsis, uh, most of the BLT protein is thought to have this secondary structure that's a coil-coil structure. So we looked to see in Pfizeria, does, does that seem to make a similar structure? And we found that yes, it's, it's pretty similar and in a similar position to Arabidopsis. And I'm just um, indicating with this black box where that coil-coil domain would lie in the alignment. Um, and you can see that not only are these, these high um, positive selection sites clustered, but actually clustered mostly within what's probably an important functional domain of the, of the protein. So in conclusion, um, you know, BLT is under purifying selection across 
uh, both by Zaria and its relatives, regardless of whether they had dendritic or stellate trichomes. And in the crown lineage, um, BLT had a relatively higher PNPS ratio than in the outgroup taxa. And we found that this increase is specifically due to positive selection on a subset of sites in BLT. So based on <laughs> these analyses, um, I hypothesized that changes in the BLT coding region could have contributed to the diversification of stellate trichomes in Phys area. And, uh, and also, based on that Arabidopsis overexpression of BLT um, can cause increased branching. I thought that perhaps even changes in the regulation um, could have contributed to actually the origin of this of this change in trichome sheet. <clears throat> so just to look at, at those questions, um, I did interspecies transformation studies. And so I made four different types of constructs, um, which I transformed into the Arabidopsis BLT mutants. So there's just again what the mutant trichome looks like that are, are branchless. And then <coughs> I would look for whether we could see what we thought to be stellate features in the transformed plates. So I either made uh, two, the two top constructs are either fully both the promoter and coding region from Pfizeria fenleri, so the stellate, um, stellate BLT. Uh, or its equivalent region in Arabidopsis, and then two chimeric constructs um, to look at these differences in, in promoter and coding. So, so either Arabidopsis promoter with the Pfizeria coding region or the opposite. And the first thing I looked at was just branch number change uh, in the transplants. So, here again, those four types of constructs, and this is just uh, a count of branches for uh, multiple lines from each construct. And it seemed pretty obvious that uh, while the promoter region doesn't seem to play a role in changing branch number, um, plants that have the Pfizeria coding region did have relatively fewer branches than those with the Arabidopsis coding region. Um, and we did do a two-way ANOVA, uh, which uh, suggests that, that, yes, these different promoter regions aren't having an effect on trichome branch number, um, but the coding region has a significant effect on trichome branches with the Pfizeria coding region <coughs> having significantly uh, fewer branches than Arabidopsis. So I also looked at trichome morphology um, across transformants. So in this case, just in those, the Arabidopsis, all Arabidopsis, the one where it was Arabidopsis um, promoter and Pfizeria coding, and then the Pfizeria promoter and Arabidopsis coding. And these are just, um, just images of a typical three-branch trichome uh, from each of these different construct types. Um, they were variable. Uh, but none of the variation we saw, they were variable, all of them were, there was no, uh, no one of them had looked especially different um, from the other transformants. And I made some measurements, just like in those earlier developmental analyses on, on branches, so comparing branch in, in just mature trichomes, the width to the length, and really saw no differences um, between the construct types in in final branch dimensions. I also made measurements of stock width um, compared to length. And in that case, it was, it was kind of interesting that <clears throat> if trichomes had the Pfizeria coding region, they actually had um, narrower and shorter stocks than those carrying the Arabidopsis coding region.
So in conclusion, um, it seems like the Pfizer promoter region can, can replace its homolog in Um the, the BLT protein of Pfizeria only seememed to partially rescue that branching phenotype of Arabidopsis mutants, since there were fewer branches in the, the, those transformed with the Pfizeria coding region. Um, while neither promoter nor coding region affected branch morphology, it does seem interesting that the coding region might have some effect on the morphology of the stock. <clears throat> so overall, over all of the, the research that we've looked at, it seems that changes in BLT, um, not in and of themselves, uh, we're not able to drive the evolution of a stellate form from a dendritic sheet. Um, but we did see that some codons within the Pfizerian BLT were under directional selection um, for substitutions and formerly conserved amino acids. Um, and three hypotheses we thought of that could possibly explain why we would see positive selection even though it's not the driver of that stellate form is that maybe these changes we're seeing in BLT have to do with diversification um, within the Pfizeria stellate form. So across Pfizeria um, stellate trichomes, there are differences in branching pattern. Um, those are probably the primary differences. And, and perhaps changes in BLT are reflective of that diversification within Pfizeria. Um, maybe during the transition, to stellate trichomes, BLT was pushed away from an adaptive optimum, and it's just taken a lot of time to, to catch up. Or perhaps um, changes during that origination of, of stellate form in, <clears throat> in other protein partners caused um, changes to protein actions, protein-protein interactions between BLT and these other branching branch promoting proteins. Um, and it's kind of like a reciprocal evolution between BLT and its protein partners. And although we're not able to answer which of these hypotheses might be correct, um, I think that this research just sets a basis for being able to look at you know, genetic and developmental changes that have not only um, like led to the evolution of, of trichrome shape, in across the mustard family, but also maybe just cell shape in general and, and better understanding how cells can, how cells can make their very complex shapes. And there are many people who think. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't know if I'll maybe I won't get to those things. But thank you everyone and thank you for being here. And I guess my my last thing is I I really want who are not here, my lovely little children. <laughs> who have probably helped me to, to finish the most um, and have been very supportive and are very excited uh, that I've almost done. And probably can do the most. Measurements of the transformed trichomes with the 
your developmental ones at the beginning? Oh, um, like are they similar? You know, I think I'm trying to remember what the exact numbers are, but I, I think they all the those morphological measurements mostly fall within the range of what you would see in a Rhabdopsis. Mm -hmm. um, except for, I think that those stocks were, were pretty short in the Pfizer area, the ones that were transformed with Pfizer area, but more typical to what a Rhabdopsis would. Are these, are stellate trichomes typical of uh, arid plants? Uh, you gave an example of how they you know, make the thing look more white. Is that a general thing, or is that like this is just one specific adaptation of this group? I don't know if specifically stellate trichomes um, are are like a characteristic of arid plants, but I do think arid plants would tend to have uh, trichomes that are highly branched. I'm gonna ask a question because I I mean I, I think it's gonna. I could tell what you'll say in front of everybody. You've got two phenotypes in the transformers. I mean, in the coding region, you have the narrower stalks and you have fewer branches. Do you think that's the same phenotype? Or two, in other words, because you have small, narrower branches, you end up with fewer, sorry, mm -hmm. narrow stalks, you end up with fewer branches? Or do you think that they might be independent phenotypes? Or so you know? So I, I think maybe. It was so. Yes, I think that maybe they're they're connected. Where you tend to have narrower stocks, and that that those trichomes that had narrower stocks made fewer branches than ones with a regular stock size. So. I mean, maybe you wonder. <laughs> I don't think you looked at this, but it made me wonder if one could look at the. Um, in the short trichomes or to the relationship between the stalk width and the number of branch bits. Oh, I didn't. I don't want to argue But I know, I, I did look at, so I think within that that low branch group, but there aren't very many measurements. Um, some of them that were more regular size. Uh, so yeah, ones that were a little wider and closer to um, the Arabidopsis trans size um, also tend to have more branches. The ones that were a little, much, much more on the narrow side, did tend to have smaller branches. But it was just, it's such a small sample. It'd be interesting, I think, to 